Smelly Feet by Paul Jennings. No! Screamed Dad. Please don't! No, no, no. Have mercy! Please, Baron, don't do it! He dropped down to his knees and started begging. Very funny, I said as I pulled off one running shoe. Dad rolled around on the floor. I'm dying! He yelled. Can't stand it! He held his nose and watched me untie the other shoe. Talk about embarrassing. He was supposed to be a grown-up man, my father, and here he was acting like a kid in grade three. He always carried on like this when I came back from tennis. My feelings were hurt. I can't smell anything, I said. You need a nose job then, he snorted. My little sister Libby put her bit in. The fox never smells its own, she said through a crinkled nose. Talk about mean. I was sick of them picking on me every time I took off my shoes. I shoved my socks into my runners and stomped off to my bedroom. I threw myself down on the bed and looked around the room. Garlic was running around the bed. with my toe. Garlic was my pet nurse. At least you like me, I said. The little mouse didn't say anything. Not so much as a squeak. In fact, something strange happened. Garlic sniffed the air. Then she closed her eyes and fell fast asleep. I jumped up and tapped the cage. Nothing. Not a movement. First I thought she was dead. Then I noticed her ribs going in and out. She was breathing. I ran across the room to fetch Dad. Just as I reached the door, I noticed Garlic sit up and sniff. She was all right. I ran back over to her. She started to totter as if she was drunk. Then she fell over and settled down into a deep sleep. I walked away and waited on the other side of the room. Garlic sat up and scampered around happily. Something strange was going on. Every time I went near the cage, Garlic would fall asleep. And when I left, she woke up. My mouse was allergic to me. I looked down at my feet. Couldn't be, could it? No, nah, they weren't that bad. Put on my slippers and approached the cage. Garlic was happy. I slowly took off one slipper and held a bare foot in front of the wire. Garlic dropped like a stone. She didn't even have time to wrinkle her nose. I put the slipper back on. And Garlic sat up and sniffed happily. This was crazy. My feet smelt so bad they could put a mouse to sleep. Just like chloroform. I had to face up to it. Even though I couldn't smell a thing, I had the strongest smelling feet in the world. I went out into the backyard to look for our cat. She was licking herself in the sun. Here, Fluffy, I said. She looked up as I pushed a bare foot into her face. Her eyes turned to glass and she fell to the ground. Fast asleep. Put the slipper back on my foot and Fluffy sprang to life. The loud meow. She hurtled off over the fence. This was crazy. My feet worked on a cat. A loud noise filled the air. Barking. It was that rotten dog down the street. His name was Odor, and it barked all night. Woof, woof, woof. On and on and on. Most nights she couldn't get to sleep for it barking. I smiled to myself. This was my big chance. I left my slippers on the porch and set off down the street. Odor was a huge dog, an Alsatian. She growled and snapped and tore at the wire gate with her teeth. I was glad she couldn't get out. I approached the gate carefully and held out a foot. Odor stopped barking. Sniffed. Her eyes watered. She held her feet up to her nose and rubbed at it furiously with her paws. And she rolled over on her back and whimpered. The poor dog was suffering terribly. It was just like Dad rolling around on the floor pretending like he was dying. Suddenly, Odor yelped and squealed. The huge dog bolted off to the far corner of the yard and sat staring at me as if I was a monster. Odo was terrified. I walked home slowly and thoughtfully. My feet could put a mouse to sleep, and a cat, but not a dog. They weren't powerful enough for dogs. Hmm, dogs must be too big, I said to myself. Dad sat on the sofa watching TV. As soon as I entered the room, he screwed up his nose. Oh, Baron, he groaned. Those feet are foul. Go and have a shower. I couldn't take any more. The world was against me. Dad was picking on me again. Garlic had fallen asleep. Fluffy had collapsed into a coma. Odor had been reduced to a whimper. Even the animals didn't like me. I rushed out of the house and slammed the door. I headed down the street without caring where I was going. Tears pricked behind my eyes. I loved animals. But it wasn't fair. I was born with smelly feet. I couldn't help it. After a bit, I found myself at the beach. The tide was in and a little river of sea water cut Turtle Island off from the shore. I felt a little better. Turtle Island, my favourite spot. And in three months' time, November, my favourite thing was going to happen. Old Shelley, one of the last South Pacific sea turtles, would haul herself up off the beach 
to lay her eggs. If you are lucky and you knew where to look, you might be there when she arrived. Every year on the 20th of November, she came to lay her eggs. Once there had been hundreds of turtles crawling up the beach every summer, but people caught them for soup, stole their eggs. Now there were hardly any turtles left. I knew where she would come to shore, but I didn't tell anyone. Not a soul. Old Shelley was 200 years old. Couldn't stand it if anything happened to her or her eggs. Seagulls swooped down, formed a swarming flock on the sand. I walked towards them. As I went, they started to collapse. One after another, they fell over and littered the beach like feathery corpses. Even the seagulls were passing out when they smelt my feet. The smile fell from my face. I had to clean my feet. Strode into the salty water and headed for Turtle Island. The sand swirled between my toes. The water was cold and fresh. I looked behind me and saw the gulls waking. They flew and squawked, alive and wide awake. Some of them followed me to the other side. They scuttled along the sand and approached me as I left the water. Nothing happened. The gulls didn't fall asleep. The sea had washed away the smell. The animals of the world were safe again. I looked along the beach and frowned. Footsteps in the sand. They walked off along the shore into the distance. I always felt as if Turtle Island was my own special place. I didn't like anyone else going there. There were some cruel people in the world, and the fewer that knew about Old Shelley the better. I followed the footsteps along for about a kilometre. They finally led to a huge sea cave. Silently made my way inside and edged around the deep pools that sank into the rocky floor. It was a favourite crayfishing spot. Three kids were lowering a cray pot into the water. It was Horse and his gang. They didn't see me at first. Ugh, empty, said Horse. Not one rotten cray. Bet someone's been here and nicked him. Horse was a real big kid. All the members of his gang were big. Greg Baker was his closest mate. Just wait till November the 20th, he said. Turtle soup. They all laughed. And turtle omelette, said Horse. Couldn't believe what I was hearing. They planned to catch old Shelley. After 200 years of swimming free in the sea, the grand old creature would end up as soup. It wasn't right. My head swam. Jumped out from behind the rock. You can't do it, I screamed. There's hardly any turtles left. She might even be the last one. They all turned and looked at me. A spy, said Horse. Baron Jackson, said his mate Greg Baker. The little turtle lover. What a dag. The other kid there was named Thistle. I didn't notice him edging his way behind me. I was too mad to notice anything. You can't hurt that turtle, I screamed. It's protected. And who's going to stop us? Sneered Greg Baker. Me, I yelled. I'll tell my dad. They thought about that for a bit. We wouldn't hurt the turtle, would we? Sneered Horse. Nah, said the other two. I knew they were lying. And they knew that I knew they were lying. But there was nothing I could do. You can't dob someone in for something they might do. Get him, yelled Horse. Thistle grabbed me from behind. The other two held one leg each. They lifted me into the air. Let me go, you scumbags, I shouted. There were tears in my eyes. I tried to blink them back as they swung me higher and higher. I struggled and kicked, but they were just too strong for me. Suddenly, they let go. I flew through the air and splashed into the deep water. I sank down, 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 and then spluttered up to the surface. I spat out salt water and headed for the rocky shore. The gang were already leaving. They laughed and shouted smart comments back at me. It was the worst day of my life. Animals fainting at my feet, tossed into the water by a bunch of bullies, and now horses gang were going to try and catch old Shelley. Walked home along the beach, shivering and wet. Thought about that turtle. Two hundred years ago she hatched on this very beach. Her mother would have laid scores of eggs. When the tide was right, the babies would have hatched and struggled towards the water. Seagulls would have pounced and eaten most of them. In the sea, fish would have gobbled others. Old Shelley might have been the only one to live. For the last 200 years, she had swum and survived. And now, Horse and his rotten gang were going to catch her. There was nothing I could do. If I told Dad about the gang, they would just lie and say I made it up. I knew those kids. They were in my class at school. I had tangled with them before. They were too strong for me. I couldn't handle them on my own. Or could I? I suddenly had an idea. Three months. I had three months to get ready before old Shelley began to lumber ashore and dig a hole for her eggs. Three months should be enough. It might work. Just might work. 
might be able to save the turtle if I use my brains and my feet. That night, I emptied out my sock drawer. I had six pairs of blue socks. Mum bought them at sale. I slipped one pair on my feet. Then I put on my running shoes. After that, I struggled into my pyjamas. I could just get my feet through the legs without taking off my shoes. I hopped into bed, but I felt guilty. I pulled back the blankets and looked at the sheets. The runners were making the sheets dirty. I jumped out of bed, crept down to the kitchen. I found two clear plastic bags, just right. I pulled them over my shoes and fastened them round my ankles with elastic bands. Terrific! I pulled up the covers and fell asleep. I had a wonderful dream. And in the morning, I faced my next problem. A shower. As soon as the coast was clear, I nipped into the bathroom and locked the door. Didn't want my little sister Libby to see me. She would dob me in for sure. The shower was on the wall over the bath. I put in the plug and turned on the shower. When the bath was full, I took off my pyjamas and lowered myself in. But I left my feet hanging out over the edge. Couldn't let my running shoes get wet. And I couldn't take them off. Otherwise, my plan would fail. That night, before bed, I took a pair of clean blue socks out of the cupboard, went outside, and I rubbed them in the dirt. Then, I threw them in the wash basket. That way, Mum would think I'd worn the socks that day, and she wouldn't get suspicious. Every morning and every night, I did the same thing. I wondered if it would work. I planned to go for three months without taking off my shoes. It was a diabolical plan. I wouldn't have done it normally, not for anything. But this was different. I had to save old Shelley from the gang, and smelly feet were my only weapon. If my feet could send a cat to sleep after only one day, imagine what they could do after three months. Three months in the same socks and same shoes, three months without taking off my running shoes. What an idea. It was magnificent. I smiled to myself. I really hoped it would work. Well, it was difficult. You can imagine what Mum would have said if she'd known. I was wearing my shoes to bed. And I had to stop Libby from finding out too. Every night for three months, I went to bed with my runners on. And every night, I dirtied a pair of socks outside and put them in the wash. Mum and Dad didn't suspect a thing. Although I did have a couple of close calls. One day Mum said, Your socks don't smell like they used to, Baron. You must be washing your feet a lot more. I just smiled politely. I didn't say anything. I also had problems at school with the phys ed teacher. I had to forge a note to get out of football and gym. These corns are taking a long time to heal, he said to me one day. I just smiled and limped off slowly. Three months passed, and I still hadn't taken off my shoes or socks once. I hoped and hoped that my plan would work. I knew that Horses Gang were planning to catch old Shelley. They sniggered every time I walked past them at school. Finally, the day came. November 20th. High tide was at half past four. After school. Old Shelley wouldn't arrive until the top of the tide and the gang wouldn't be able to do anything while they were in school. All went well in the morning, but after lunch it was different. I walked into class and sat down in the seat. The day was hot. Blowflies buzzed in the sticky air. Mr. Lovell sat at his desk and wiped his brow. I looked around. There were three empty seats. Horse and his mates weren't there. They were wagging school. And I knew exactly where they were. Down the beach, waiting for old Shelley. I went cold all over. What if old Shelley came early? What if I was wrong about the tides? Turtle soup. I couldn't bear to think about it. Mr. Lovell, I yelled. I have to go home. I forgot something. Horses after old Shelley. All the kids looked at me. They thought I was crazy. Mr. Lovell frowned. He didn't like anyone calling out without putting up their hand. Don't be silly, Baron, he growled. We aren't allowed to let students go home without their parents' permission. But I have to go, I yelled. Old Shelley is... Mr. Lovell interrupted. He was angry. Sit down, boy. Behave yourself. You don't understand, I began. I understand that you'll be waiting outside the principal's office if you don't be quiet, he said. I sat down. It was useless. Kids don't have any power. They just have to do what they're told. Or do they? I looked at my feet. I looked at the running shoes and the socks that hadn't been changed for three months. I bent down and undid the laces. Then I pulled off my shoes and socks. I stepped out into the aisle, bare feet. The room suddenly grew silent. The hairs stood up on the back of my neck. I looked at my feet. Long black nails curled out of my putrid toes. Slimy, furry skin was coated with blue sock fuzz. 
Swollen veins ran like choked rivers under the rancid flesh. The air seemed to ripple and shimmer with an invisible stench. I sniffed. Nothing. Couldn't smell a thing. But the others could. The blowflies were the first to go. They fell from the ceiling like rain. They dropped to the floor without so much as a buzz. Mr. Lovell jumped up as if a pin had been stuck into him. Then he slumped on his desk. Asleep. A crumpled heap of dreams. The class collapsed together. They just keeled over as if they had breathed a deadly gas. They were alive, but they slept and snored. Victims of my fetid feet. I wish I could say that there were smiles on their lips, but they weren't. Their faces were screwed up like sour cabbages. I ran out of the room and across the schoolyard. The caretaker was emptying a rubbish bin into the burner. He dropped the bin and flopped unconscious to the ground as I passed. My three-month smell was powerful. It could work in the open at a distance of ten metres. Horse and his gang wouldn't have a chance. They wouldn't even get near me. But I had to hurry. If old Shelley came early, I, I couldn't bear to think about it. The beach bus was pulling up at the curb. I had one dollar with me. Just enough. I jumped into the bus steps. Turtle Island, please, I said to the driver. He didn't answer. He was fast asleep in his seat with the engine still ticking over. I looked along the row of passengers. All of them were snoring their heads off. I'd guessed the whole bus. Oh no, I said. Jumped off the bus and headed for the beach. The quickest way was straight through the shopping mall. I didn't really want to run barefoot through the town, but this was an emergency. I passed a lady on a bike. She fell asleep straight away, still rolling along the road. The bike tottered and then crashed into a bush. This was terrible. No one could come near me without falling asleep. Ran over to help her, but her eyes were firmly closed. The best thing I could do was to get away from her as quickly as possible. I jogged into the shopping mall. People fell to the ground in slumbering waves as I approached. I stopped and stared around. The street was silent. Hundreds of people slept on footpaths and in the shops. A policeman snored in the middle of the road. I felt as if I was the only person in the world who was awake. Suddenly I felt lonely and sad. But then I thought of old Shelley, that poor helpless turtle dragging its ancient shell up the beach to the waiting horse in his cooking pot. I ran on. My heart hammered. My knees knocked. My feet fumed. Old Shelley, I said, I'm coming, I'm coming. I pounded on and on, not stopping for the people around me as they fell to the ground like leaves tumbling in autumn. At last I reached the beach. The tide was in. Strong current cut me off from Turtle Island. A flock of seagulls flew overhead. They plummeted to the ground, reminding me of planes that had lost their pilots. My feet still worked. They were as powerful as ever. I gazed at the swiftly running water. I peered along the beach for a boat. There was none. I looked at my foul feet. If only I could fly. On the wind, I thought I heard wicked laughter. Old Shelley, I mumbled. I'm coming. I plunged into the sea and waded towards the island. My toes sank into the sand. I could feel the grain scouring my skin, washing away at three months of muck. The water was clear and cold and salty. On and on I struggled through the cleansing stream, splashing, jumping, crying until I reached the other side. The seagulls scampered around my feet. They were awake. They didn't even yawn. I looked down at my lily-white toes. They were spotless. The water had stolen their strength. Three months of saving my spell. Gone. Scrubbed away by the salt in the sand. There was no sign of the three bullies, but I knew where to find them. I staggered up to the top of a huge sand dune and stared along the beach. Yep, there they were. And there, in the clear blue water, was a moving shadow. Old Shelley. Horse and his mates hadn't seen her. There was still a chance. Plunged down the dune towards them, yelling and screaming, trying to distract them from their search. It worked. They turned around to watch me approach. I had to draw them off. Once they saw the turtle, they would know which part of the beach she was on. Even if old Shelley escaped, they would dig around and find the eggs. I knew it was no use arguing with them. They wouldn't listen. I had to say something mean. Bird brain, I said weakly to horse. I felt silly. It didn't even come out right. It wasn't tough. I bunched up my fists. Get off this island, I ordered. And who's going to make us, jeered horse. Me, I said. I felt very small. They were real big kids. They walked towards me with snarling faces. I turned and ran. Get him! They pelted after me. I scrambled up the sand dune and along the top. I felt them panting behind me. The sandy ground turned to rock. I cut my bare feet. 
They hurt like crazy. Slowed down to a hobble. My toes were bleeding. It was no use. The gang had me trapped. I turned and faced the gang. Behind them, way below, I could see old Shelley hauling herself over the sand. They hadn't seen her yet. Thistles circled around me. They closed in. I tried to find something to defend myself. There was nothing. I put my hands in my pocket in a desperate search. My fingers found something useful. Hey, get back, I yelled, or I'll use these. A horse laughed out loud. We're not scared of a pair of... He never finished. He crashed to the ground like a tree falling. The others followed. They were fast asleep on the sand. I held my putrid socks in the air. Boy, were they powerful. I put the socks near the sleeping bullies. Then I walked down to the beach. Old Shelley was digging a hole with her flippers. Slowly, painfully, she dug and dug. She was helpless. Don't worry, girl, I said. I won't hurt you. I sat a little way off and watched the miracle. I watched the eggs drop like beads from a broken necklace. The sun sank into the sea, lighting the old turtle with gold. I watched as old Shelley covered the eggs and then crawled back towards the shore. Just as she reached the edge, she turned and nodded her head as if to thank me. Think nothing of it, I said. Your eggs are safe now. I'll see you next year. I have to admit there was a tear in my eye as I watched her sink under the water and swim out beneath the silvery arms of the rippling moonbeams. I went back and fetched the socks. I threw them in the sea and waited. In no time at all, Horse and his mates started to stir. They sat up and peered into the darkness. They couldn't work it out. It was light when they'd fallen asleep. They didn't know where the sun had gone. Suddenly, Horse gave an enormous scream. He ran for it. The others followed him, belting along the sand as if a demon was after them. They thought I had strange powers. I guess if you think about it, they were right in a funny sort of way. I walked slowly home. A nasty thought entered my mind. What if Horse found more members for his gang? What if they came back to wait for old Shelley next November? I was worried, but then I chuckled and spoke to myself. If I start going to bed with shoes on tonight, I said, my feet ought to be pretty strong by this time next year.